looks like we are live. Let me switch this over. Perfect. All right, would you like a water bottle? Yeah. I got you. guy going. Hello everybody and welcome to another camera class. My name is Saxon. Uh, so last week we did the uh, intro to cameras and it was really just supposed to be a introductory lesson into really what are cameras, how does this all work, uh, keeping us on that automatic setting so we can stay familiar with our camera. We don't want to get boggled down with all the different technical terms and all of the different things that our camera can get. I think a lot of people, when I'm first teaching about cameras, they get very kind of frustrated overall because of how much is on there. I remember the Sony Shake video you did. Oh, well, hello there. Nice to meet you, Bambo. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Big fan of Sony. Uh, but yes, so with any of the camera stuff that we're talking about today, we're going to really just try to move on from our entry level and more or so get into more advanced techniques with the camera. The more advanced techniques really come down to the manual control of the camera, so that's what we'll be reviewing today. As well as, too, we'll be talking about lenses towards the end of class. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing I start with is why do we go more advanced point-and-shoot DSLR or mirrorless? Why do we start advancing into this world? It's to get better quality images, but it's also to take more advantage of what cameras can do. Um, we have graduated as far as humans from a, uh, a plate or a silver plate based system where you would have a silver plate with a coating on there. You would expose that plate for about 16 minutes and then it would a picture would pop up. That's one of the first cameras in the 1800s. We then move into film photography that's developed later in the 1930s in Germany, and now we're in this digital age of photography, which makes it so instantaneous, it's unbelievable. When we think of those old photography methods, they were never automatic. Everything that they did was based on what they saw, what they observed, and then changing things manually. So us going more advanced does two things. One. It gives us, the photographer, the ability to take a more advanced photo with more precise but much more personalized control versus allowing the technology that is very advanced and very good to do the work for us. Both are fine, and I don't want to ever say that you know doing and shooting an automatic is a bad thing because these new cameras are very good. But if we really want to understand what we're getting ourselves involved to and what we spent so much money on, um, this is where we then learn the more advanced settings on there. Oh, thanks for subscribing, Bambo. First thing we're going to talk about is snapshots versus photographs. So I took these two pictures a while back. I like to look at snapshots as a quick picture. It's not really meant for you to sit and dissect things or to figure out, you know, symmetry or pair or like the line movement on things or color. It's really meant to just be a quick image. This is something that I might send to a friend if they're like, hey, where are you? This is where I'm at. Take a picture of it. But if I want to take a photograph, I want to put time and thought into it. I want to put camera manipulation into it. I want to make sure that what I'm doing with the camera is using it as a tool to capture whatever it is I'm trying to capture. So in the next image, this would be a photograph that I then took using my camera. I didn't edit or change anything. I was able to manipulate my camera in such a way where I was able to emphasize things like lighting. This whole skyline picture that we have in our uh, northern escalator in our store is all illuminated. And so the lighting that was behind it, I could over, I could use it in a fun way by lowering my ISO and allowing my camera to be less sensitive towards the light. Um, we also have then uh, canned recessed lighting, that's that yellow orange tint. I was able to then play with my exposure compensation and change that up a little bit too. From there, I was able to make sure that my image was not only just on a straight line going horizontally, but I was trying to look to see if I could get symmetry on the image as a whole and take a little bit more of a creative shot. As well too, you're able to get a really nice reflection in the windows of the actual skyline that you see on the skyscrapers. So it's those little thoughts that I had while taking the photo that change something like this 
from this. So again, something like a snapshot, not thought out, quick picture, just an easy, easy thing. A photograph, in my opinion, or in my thought process, is something that has a little bit more manipulation, thought process is control. Control being the biggest thing. If we're not in control of the camera, then we're not utilizing all of its features to the fullest. So the step one, and I think I mentioned this last week, learn your camera. I gave some tips and tricks of different websites and different programs that you can look into that really give you a nice understanding of what the camera is doing and kind of where you're at with it, button layouts, everything else. But as you can see from this image, there are lots of different cameras, and these are just the three main brands. Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fujifilm, Panasonic, Olympus, Leica, Hasselblad. You have so many different brands out there to choose from. Since I made this picture, or since I put all this together, uh, Can Canon has three new cameras in that lineup. Sony has about five new cameras in the lineup. Nikon has about four new cameras in their lineup. So these are ever-changing and different things that are popping up as you keep going. It's never going to stay the same. At the current moment, there hasn't been a giant push in the camera world technology other than maybe the global shutter and some of the other stuff that people like Leica are changing with their um, completely customizable menu system on their SL3 camera. Um, there really isn't anything extremely new happening in the world of cameras that hasn't already been done or isn't just kind of a little bit better than what's already out there. But the first step in all camera and all anything that you do is learn the product. Take a look at your owner's manual, read through the camera, go on YouTube, watch a couple videos, familiarize yourself with whatever product you bought, because that's the first step in making sure that you feel comfortable with the device, even if you don't understand things like lighting or control or f-stop or shutter or any of that. Now when we do talk about editing, a lot of people question it right off the bat. Even if you're shooting in an automatic setting, you can do in, uh, edit photos, you can edit photos, and you can use software like Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One Pro, Corel Paint Shop Pro. I do like Adobe's products. My only downside to them is you pay monthly for their services. You can't just buy the, um, you can't buy it outright. Uh, when we look at something like the Capture One Pro and Corel Paint Shop Pro, you can actually download those and pay one time. It's about a $300 or $200 fee. Then you get it for life. So it's not a bad kind of investment if this is something that you're serious about or into. Uh, even if you're just a hobbyist, editing photos is always a good idea. Really what we're going to dive into is the mode dial. Now, I think I mentioned this the last time in the class. I look at the mode dial as your gear shift in your car. It's your way to go into manual, reverse, automatic, shifting different gears, going into neutral. That's how that works. The camera is no different. Manual control, aperture priority, shutter priority, etc. That's all available on this mode dial wheel. Now, to be a little more specific, the next steps in your programming. So, we start with automatic. I, tell, I showed everybody that last week. Um, automatic is your starting point. That's where the camera's doing the work for you. You are just pointing and shooting. Program automatic now takes away some of the little controls on there and gives the user the ability to really change some settings on there. Your focus parameter, your white balance, um, your... Uh, oh man, there's a few other ones that are slipping my mind right now. Focus parameter, white balance, oh, recognition targeting, um, uh, ISO. There's a few other things too. Every camera is a little different on what you can control with it, but really what that's doing for you is it's still allowing the camera to control things like your f-stop, your shutter speed, which are the two things that confuse, I'd say, most photographers the most when they're starting off. It lets the user still use all the other cool features on there, but then allows for the user to change and manipulate small things. So for people who are just trying to break out of automatic, I typically recommend Program Auto. It's a good way to start learning more of the uh, other programs the camera can do. Then we have Aperture and Shutter Priority, which we're going to talk a little bit more about as this keeps moving forward. But those are controls over just the aperture format of the camera and the shutter format of the camera. <laughs> Lastly on the screen, we have Full Manual. Full manual is going to be full manual control of every setting on the camera. 
This is great for the more experienced photographer, for anybody who is just trying to really manipulate and use the camera to its fullest ability. Because no matter what, an automatic camera is amazing. It does a great job, especially the newer ones nowadays. However, there's still stuff that we're going to see in a slightly different way that we're going to want to try to learn and manipulate through the camera. All of these controls start at what we call the exposure triangle. Now, the exposure triangle is a kind of a funny concept because typically you'll see a lot of charts if you ever took photography in school or you look this up online, they do a little pyramid. And the pyramid usually has aperture on one side, shutter on one side, ISO on the bottom. In this case, I like to use this little line graph because for me, everything is separate in photography. At the same time though, it's all connected. And we have to kind of remember that too. Especially if we're shooting on something like manual, if we adjust the aperture to a different number, we might have to change our shutter speed. And if we change our shutter speed, that might affect how much light is coming into the camera. So we might want to do some more ISO on there. And if we do a lot of ISO on the camera, maybe we need to readjust the aperture and the shutter and so on and so forth. That's the trickiest part with photography. I can show you all of this stuff, but there's no one way to do it. Everybody has their own system. Everybody has their own methodology when it comes to it. So let's break down each one of these different layers of the pyramid and talk about it individually. Start with aperture. The best way I can describe aperture is that aperture is like the iris of your eyeball. If you are to look at your eye in the mirror, you'll notice that you have a black dot in your eye. What tends to happen is that when there's less light in the room, your iris gets bigger. When you are in an area with lots of light, it gets really small. The idea behind that, at least the way that I understand it, is that the human eye reacts to how much light is available towards you, and it then readjusts how much it's letting into your body. So number one, it doesn't blind. Number two, it doesn't hurt you. But then number three, it properly adapts to whatever area that it's in. We can think about our aperture very similarly. Aperture is the ability for us to let light into the camera through its actual little metal shutters. However, the main function of aperture comes down to background and foreground separation. When we look at aperture, the highest number for our aperture is going to give us background and foreground. So if we look at f22 right now on the, on the diagram up there, we'll see that we can see the pyramid and the stick person as they're walking, or as they're waving, I should say. F22 would be a great number if you're someone who's on vacation, you're the family, you guys are standing in front of Buckingham Palace, you want to take a picture. That would probably be the best because you get that in the background, you get to see everything in the image. But now let's say that the kids are in front of a, a brick wall at school, they're you know, lined up for their first day, do you really care about that brick wall? Maybe not. Maybe you have a beautiful flower that's right in your garden, you just want to get the rose that's, that just bloomed. F1.4 on this diagram shows an all blurred out background with our stick figure being present. As we can see, the whole background is gone. It's completely blurred out and all we have is our subject matter in the foreground. That's the power of aperture. Not every lens can go that low though. Keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end when we get into lenses. But every lens has what we call a maximum aperture. When you're reading lenses, you might see that the higher quality telephoto lenses have an f2.8. That means that if you're using something like a telephoto lens at 24 to 70 or 70 to 200, you're going to get a level of background blur that's similar to that. Where you can kind of make out those are pyramids, but at the same time, they're starting to lose that shape. Now, if you buy a prime lens, something like a 50 millimeter, 75 millimeter, 35 millimeter, you might get the ability to get stuff like an f-stop 1.4. Those are great for professional-based photographers, people who are trying to get the best picture possible and blur the background out. It's not the easiest thing to do, and a lot of people struggle with it when they're first starting. Um, however, though, depending on the lens that you have, the focus parameters you have set up, you can really just focus in on one person or one thing and blur the rest out depending on the quality of lens that you have. Now to kind of iterate all this, I've got some pictures to show examples of. These are both shot with aperture priority. 
If we look at something like the dog nose, the dog nose is completely in full focus. However, the dog behind it is not in full focus. This means that an aperture of probably about 5.6 to 6 point so is being used right now. So we go back to our chart. I probably would say that's more of maybe an F4 because we can definitely tell that these are still pyramids. However, we're starting to lose that crispness, that sharpness. In the same boat, when I go to the next photo again, we can still see that's a dog behind our other dog here, but we can't see exactly what the eyes are looking or maybe the finer details of the fur and everything else. Our squirrel in a similar boat. The squirrel's eating, standing on a tree branch right there. When we look around, we can see that the whole background is blurred out pretty intensely. I probably would put this closer to a 1.4 in aperture. However, our squirrel's in perfect focus. And on top of that, the little feet are also in focus too. But on top of that, we can tell that the green behind them is probably going to be foliage, a tree, what have you. But our main focus right here is the squirrel. So if we look at it from the chart point of view, that's probably close to that 1.4, 2.0 range. Another reason we might want to do aperture priority is to blur the background out and put maybe some form of lighting. We call these bokeh or bokeh dots. And what that's really doing is that when we focus in on a subject matter and we have lights behind that image, we tend to get a really cool circle light effect. Those are just a strand of Christmas lights that are behind the little minifigure from Lego. And the ability to focus in on our subject and create this blur in the background has a really cool effect on the image and just lends itself to be a little more interesting to the eye. So if you're curious with experimenting, putting a subject matter in focus and then having lights behind it can really do a lot of fun and, let's say, crazy things to the image itself. Now, why do we want to use aperture priority mode? And this is a good image to me to explain that. When you have a gorgeous backdrop like this, where you've got a sun setting and beautiful water cascading, what seems to be a little waterfall, or at least a cove on the one side, rocks in the water, then you have your girlfriend, your sister, your cousin, maybe even your mom standing there, and you want to take a beautiful picture of the whole environment plus her, aperture priority would be a great example of something to use for that. Because what we're really focused on here is getting both her and the background in focus together. Now we can probably use manual. Auto might see her and automatically try to go into a more in-depth image there where it's only focusing on her and blurring out the background. So us using aperture priority at least gives us the ability to not have to worry about that anymore. And we can now allow for us to focus in on the creative aspect of it. We talked about the rule of thirds last week. We divide this image up she hits the rule of thirds perfectly. You have a gorgeous sunset with a horizon line where that's meeting the sky, and overall the rocks, the colors, everything else looks wonderful. So by doing that one simple mode change and doing something that's more, how do you say, process oriented rather than automatic like our automatic setting would be, we're giving ourselves just that much extra wiggle room when we're taking photos. To review again, F32, the higher the number when it comes to aperture, the more that you're going to see in the whole image. So in this case, we've got a blue dumpster and we've got our tree. We can see that blue dumpster, and as a photographer, that might bother you. There might not be a way to get that out. However, though, if we blur everything and we just focus in on the tree bark, then we're going to be able to hide that background and be preventative in our, in our process to see it. Next up is shutter speed. Now shutter speed is a tricky one. And the way I look at shutter speed is you are taking a picture based on the movement of the subject that you're shooting. If my uh, stick figure is running, I might set it at one and five hundredth of a second or faster because I want to make sure I capture that motion. 
if they're swinging and they're moving, if I take something that's a slow shutter speed, what I'm doing is creating more motion and blur. One of the things we talked about last week was that when we take photos, we want to be still while we take the photos, not moving around and shaking, because I don't cause blurry images. In the same case of us having good stability on the camera, if our subject's matter is moving, but we're not using the proper shutter speed, we're going to get blurry images. And that's where you see a lot of people, in my opinion, get frustrated. Shutter doesn't sometimes equate in certain ways to people like it does for others, and it's a little tricky. However, though, pretty fairly simple. You're setting the speed to then make sure that whatever the movement or whatever the motion that the subject matter is going through, and it could be a still image. In that case, you probably can get away with 125th or 130th of a second. But depending on how your grip is, that could also affect it too. Typically when you get to something like a half second exposure, 30 seconds that you're holding down for. Sorry, no, I thought it was a half second, not a half minute. It's a half second exposure. So you, when you look at that, it's not a lot of time for that shutter to, or that's a, a long time for the shutter to open and close. Therefore, if I have someone that's running, I'm probably going to catch them in a blurry state. However, if I raise my shutter speed up to a higher number, I have a better chance of capturing that fast moving object without getting any blur. It's similar to aperture where there's nine different boxes that you're picking from and which one do you go with. It's not based on any one science or the other. It's all based on practice, on rudimentary practice of going out, shooting images, and making sure that you get the image that you're looking for. If we have something like my surfer view here, when you're taking a picture of pure action, of something very sports driven, you're going to want to use a one, one in a thousandth ISO or higher. That's going to ensure that you're pausing the image, especially when there's a lot of movement going on. Now, if your kids are playing basketball, you probably don't need that. Um, if your kids are doing motocross, you're probably going to want to use that. So it's one of those things where it depends on the environment that you're in to shoot at that one in a thousandth. But I like to tell people that if you're going to do anything that has a lot of speed to it, a lot of movement to it, you want to make sure you're setting it at least one in a thousand or higher. The higher or shutter speed in general gives sense of motion. In this photo, I love this one, you have a woodpecker who looks like it just got a little fly. And then from there, you've got this beautiful yellow, green, brown fur. And you've got slight movement on the wings. Now, if we would have maybe raised this up a little bit more on the shutter speed, we probably would have gotten the image with no problem, but we didn't. In this case, we got what we got, but the wings having that slight blurriness make it quite interesting to look at as the viewer. Blur, I always get asked this question, I know no one asked me, but I remember it. Uh, <laughs> Blur is one of those things where some people like it. They think it adds to the photo to kind of more of this raw type photo style. Some people can't stand it and they think that it is the worst thing. Um, I was reading online that there's this new wedding trend of people taking you know, good professional uh, photos, but then what they'll do is the photographer will also shoot blurry images and they'll use that as well too. And I find it a weird supplement because way back in the day, if anyone got a blurry image, you'd be kind of laughed at. But now, it's becoming this thing where people kind of treat blurry images as that motion, as that sense of urgency or movement. So when we look at the wings, and we can see that the wings are out of focus because of the movement that's going on, it almost looks really cool that we have this beautiful bird body in full focus, yet our wings are what's fluttering. Shutter speed also helps with things like uh, long exposures. So in the world, and I think I mentioned this earlier, bulb, that's the B setting on your camera. Now some cameras will have the B on the mode dial, others will have B within their ISO. What B does is it stands for bulb. And the idea behind bulb is that as long as you keep that shutter open, it'll remain open. Some cameras do it where one click stays open for as long as you want it to stay open, you click it again, It'll close. Um, other times, people will use the um, 
B button and it will only remain open if you hold down the button. Both are fine, both are acceptable, but most nowadays should definitely be where you press once, it'll start, and then you press again, it'll stop. What we're getting out of long exposure though is an oversaturation of colors. If you look at the greens up here, you can see how complex the colors are. It's not just one or two shades of green. It almost looks to appear to be maybe six or seven, maybe even eight shades of green. On top of this too, you have a beautiful waterfall cutting through these rocks. And this is where the long exposure really comes into. It's the sense of movement. You can see the white waters as they come down, how they flow through the whole image. If you were watching this in real life, it probably wouldn't be that thick white as it's going down. It would be a little lighter. But because we're doing the long exposure, um, obviously the streams that have been established through years of erosion are still there. However, that splash, that movement, that would look a little bit different if we did a shorter exposure. This is another example. In this case, we have a gentleman in a red coat standing in front of a train station. His bike is parked behind him. This is a long exposure, about eight to nine seconds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, over on the top, you can see the detail inside the brick, the discoloration. You can see the movement of the train. Again, the train moves right past him. He's perfectly still. And you can see these beautiful line marks as they cut across. It just looks really cool. On top of that, you can almost see through the train, because if you think about trains, they're all connected by uh, the cars. And when those trains go by, they are picking up information behind those train cars. And that's why we can see things like that right there. And almost what appears to be a sunset with a um, tree or two in the background. So we can create moody, interesting images with these long exposure shots. Can I have a question? Yeah. So is this one done like with uh, the uh, manual focus? This would be. I mean, it could be go either way. So right now, we haven't really talked about manual. Manual is going to be the combination of all three, shutter, ISO, and um, aperture. Because I mean, like the uh, like you said, the bike and the guy are in focus, mm -hmm. and with the auto, you only get one, no? Well, the autofocus, you get one depending on the camera that you're using. So oh. it depends on your model. If you have a higher end camera that can do multi-person or multi-point detection, then yes, it would get both. Oh, okay. Which could be the case for him. Unfortunately, I don't know exactly what camera he was using in this image. Um, but yeah, you, know, you can set it up. Oh, but it's possible. Then. Okay. It is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Your main bet, though, is probably at least to start start with aperture priority. Super mm -hmm. easy to get into. Really does all uh, does a lot of or sorry shutter priority does a lot of good work for you. What it's really there to do is to give the user the ability to not feel boggled down with the automatic or the um, program auto or even the full manual. Shutter and aperture are fantastic settings to use on the camera and definitely good modes to have. Why use shutter priority? This is my favorite image for that exact reason. The thing that really bothers me when it comes to photography is that people rush into it without doing the extra research about what they should be doing. This is a customer that sent this image to me maybe five, three years ago, and uh, I had to show everybody in the, st in the staff, and they laughed. Um, they had to come back in, and uh, now she loves the camera. But regardless, she was taking a picture of her kid's flag football game, or flag, no, frisbee, sorry, frisbee, ultimate frisbee, that's the name. Um, in this case, she got a very blurry image. Now, there's a lot of different factors. First off, I think it's my time just based on how dark the sky looks over there. That could just be my imagination. On top of that, too, um, we can just see how slow that shutter would have been going to not capture them in full focus. But I think the color looks all right, especially since it's a park. There's probably no colorful lights at this park. There's nothing really to play with, and the sun is setting and going down, so you don't have as much wiggle room to do. And depending on what camera she was using, which I think was an older Canon EOS 70D, um, she wasn't able to uh, necessarily change the ISO to help work with the darkness. So why do we use something like shutter priority? It's for features like this, where when we're getting an image, we're getting something with a lot of movement, a lot of blur, and we want to try to combat that as best as we can. 
So to, to review, you've got a, a motocross guy going across all these different cameras on the top there. When you're shooting something like this, one in fifteen hundredth of a second, one in two thousandths of a second, one in a thousandth of a second, those are all very appropriate numbers given what you're trying to accomplish. Last but not least, ISO. ISO is one of my favorite personal ones because I think ISO is so unique. Um, to anyone who has shot film photography before, you might know that whatever your film said on there, so if it said Kodak 200, um, uh, oh, just thought about another one. Ilford 400, it could also say, I think, I know it's Kodak. Fu yeah, Fujifilm also makes their own film. Regardless though, companies make their own film for a reason. They put different types of light saturation onto the physical roll. In this case, our camera can do that, but what our camera does instead is takes those, uh, takes that and is able to manipulate the sensor itself. So when we set ISO, what we're doing is setting the light and dark sensitivity to the camera. For example, when we look, we can see how beautiful a sunset looks in 199, uh, or sorry, in 100. I took my glasses off for a second to rub my eyes. <laughs> Blind as a bat. In ISO 100, it's a good starting point ISO. It's great for daytime photography, great for when you have a lot of sunlight because you're making your exposure lesser because you have a lot of light saturating the image. However, let's say we don't have a lot of light. In this case, this bridge or dock going out into the middle of the sea doesn't have the best light. However, we can change our ISO to give us more sensitivity towards the light. So at 200, the sky becomes more pronounced. At 400, not only is the sky now more pronounced, but our water has a better glisten to it. And when we get all the way up to 800 ISO, we have a full colorful background, a really washed out underneath part of the bridge, more view of the sand that's there, and then a lot more water, the colors of water. Personally, for me on this image, I would probably go with 200. I think the 800 is a little too bright and flashy, but I think that 200 has just a really nice color. ISO acquaints to noise. So you'll hear this terminology a lot, blurriness, noise. ISO is what brings that out and brings the worst out, I would say. So for example, when we look at ISO 100, we can see a clean image. Uh, it looks good. Side of the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building, I think it's the Chrysler, I'm being honest. You can see it in perfect clarity, the sky's in perfect clarity. Yet when we move over to ISO 3200, we see a very noisy image. We see a lot of static, if you will. And that's because we're not giving our camera, or giving our camera too much light when taking that image. We don't have to jack our ISO up all the way, we don't have to do it all the way down either. But we have to find the middle term or the perfect term uh, for where we're taking our images. A lot of people will leave this on automatic. I have no issue in that uh, personally. However, I do like to then readjust my ISO based on what the camera sees. If the camera recommends shooting at 400, that's fine. I might bump to 5 or to 3 or to 600 just to see what that image looks like. Uh, maybe it creates more mood. Maybe it gives me a little bit better lighting situation and takes away some of the uh, softer edges to the image. There's all sorts of things that can happen um, when playing with the ISO. So in the case of ISO, you don't have to be at 100 every single time, but you also don't need to be at 3200 every single time. Question before you move? Yes. So is this picture taken like uh, that's the normal picture it took or is this zoomed in? Nope. This is going to be the normal picture. So oh, okay. uh, in this case, the photographer took two pictures of the same spot. They then drew a line, they then schlepped over one side. And you can see there's a slight seam on the image itself. Okay. Um, but really what's happening here is that when you turn it up too high, you will get this almost snow-like quality with your image. Oh, that's okay. noise. So even like a normal picture, that's what I was like, I thought it was maybe zoomed in, that's when you got it, but no. Yeah. Okay. 
So auto ISO, when to use it. I talk about light sensitivity and I talk about using ISO in kind of what situations. However, I strongly recommend automatic ISO. I think it is really the way to go. It keeps it simple. It lets you focus on the shutter, the aperture priority, um, or full manual experience. But even in full manual, you can set it to be auto ISO. Now, if that's not your cup of tea, places I might recommend to use automatic ISO would be indoor and outdoor events. So my best example, I have a parent that came in last year, her son was getting ready for prom. For prom, they were gonna do photos at all of these different locations. And so she had to bring her camera with her. And her question to me was, what should I do for my ISO? And I recommended using the automatic ISO because you're gonna be going through different lighting situations, inside, outside. You're gonna be going into dark spaces. You're gonna be kind of taking pictures of everything at this point in all different environments. So there's no point to me in setting your ISO to something that you're gonna then end up changing. So for me, I personally would use auto ISO nearly all the time. I have a couple manual cameras that I really love that I'm particular with. But for majority of what I'm doing, auto ISO would be the way to go. All of them have auto ISO? All of them have auto ISO. Now every camera will have a different maximum uh, ISO. So like in the last slot, we can pretend like in this case, maybe 10 is the lowest, or 100 is the lowest, and 100 is the lowest on these cameras. Uh, 3200, we can pretend that's the lowest, or the highest. We have all that wiggle room to then change the number to get exactly what we need for the image. Um, Oh yes, so with that being said, some cameras will have a much higher ISO than others. A good brand to look at who's in that similar pathway is basically Sony. Sony has a great image processor, it has great everything, but where Sony exceeds the most and others fail at are its ISO, is its low light performance. As one of the biggest selling points too towards uh, the new mirrorless cameras is the ability to have that low light performance. So to review, we've got our piggies on the top, uh, top pit, top section over here. Uh, if you look at F16, you can see the two pigs in the whole background. And as we start to go down, we start to lose the background. However, we don't lose it completely because it's a small target. And you don't really have probably the strongest lens on this camera was ever taken. However, though, we can see at 1.4, our background is basically when it comes to shutter speed, the person swinging this hammer is swinging it at the same exact speed every time. We start at 1 1,000, we can see it clearly in motion, hand on hammer. Go to 1 and 250th, and now the hammer itself is blurred, but our hand is pretty good. Then you go to 1 60th, 1 15th, 1 8th, 1 4th, 1 half. This is now going to be your It's going to be your way of controlling at which speed this thing is closing and firing and capturing. If we have something that is moving fast, like a hammer hitting a board, then we're going to want to use something like a one in a thousand to make sure we capture that image properly. But if we're slow, if it's not moving and doing much, we can go with a slower speed. Slower speeds are going to let more light into the camera, which will overall benefit our image. However, if we are at the motocross game or we are say watching the Chicago Fire at Soldier Field, then there is a chance that if we don't do one in the thousands for that speed, we're going to miss that once in a life opportunity to get that image. Last thing on that bottom row is ISO. So starting at ISO 100, you've got a penny and a table. And as you keep bumping up the ISO, you can slowly but surely start to see the pixelation throughout the whole image. Which again, can... I won't say it can be negative, it, it is negative. I, noise never looks good on an image. Blurriness, I can sometimes agree with, but as far as noise is concerned, I don't think that that's the best thing to have with your image. If you can avoid it, I would avoid it. Next thing we can talk about is exposure meter. Exposure meter is very similar to ISO. Last week when we had this class, we talked about that black and white plus and check mark button on the camera. 
That's your exposure compensation lock. If you press that button and then use one of the command dials, or some cameras even have a dial just dedicated towards ISO, or sorry, exposure, then what you're able to do is change everything on a dime. So where ISO is the sensitivity of light that we're letting into the camera, exposure meter is the lightness or darkness of the image. What I tell customers and everybody else all the time is that you can make an image plus two, we can always make it darker, However, it's really difficult to make something lighter go darker. Depending on where the image was taken, depending on what time of night it was taken or day, um, you might not be able to replicate that same thing. Now, we talk about separating everything, where certain settings would be best. If we're going to do full manual, now we're getting full control over the aperture, shutter, and ISO of the camera, the three big parts that then set aside cameras from cell phones and other different accessories that take pictures. So this is one of my personal favorite segments. This is where I go through all of the different uh, pictures. We talk about it for a little bit, and if anybody has questions, always feel free to interrupt. So in this case, we have two old buildings. This appears to be Germany. Um, what I like about this image is the fact that there are a couple different tools going on. So one, I would say ISO is probably at about 250 to 500. It doesn't necessarily have to be too high, but given the darkness and given the fact that I see a little bit of pixelation in here and in there, I think it might have been a little too high as far as the ISO is concerned. Shutter, there's nothing moving in this image, so shutter could be low, probably one in a hundredth of a second. And then as far as aperture goes, you can really see that the photographer was trying to get in the middle of the street. Um, in that case, they're probably then using something like a 22 or a 16, where it's pretty wide open for the aperture, meaning they're going to get most of that image in the sweet spot, trying to get it out. Here we have some cherry blossoms. We've got two cherry blossoms in our forefront and attention, and then what appears to be other, uh, other cherry blossoms in the background. Those cherry blossoms in the background are probably being blocked with an aperture of maybe four, maybe five, because if we think about it, we can see the background clearly. However, we don't necessarily see the detail of the flowers. We can see that these have bloomed and they're open and they're beautiful. So again, depending on what you're trying to capture with it, the, um, the aperture can really help either blur that background out or keep it in focus. ISO is probably going to be low, about 100, because there's a lot of sunlight coming from natural directions. We can see how that light is hitting on both of our flowers. And then last but not least is then going to be um, the, ice, or sorry, the shutter speed which depending on the wind and the movement, the vibration of this uh, you know, tree as it's going, you might have to set to one 250th of a second, but I think one, one and a hundredth of a second is more than enough. Here we have our two firemen walking into either a photo shoot or some sort of battle. Um, we can see that our fireman here is in perfect focus see his walkie-talkie, the helmet, the detail on there. Um, we can see it all. However, we can't see the fireman behind him, but just kind of given context of the image, we can put two and two together. I would not say that this is a 2.8 or a 1.4. I probably would have put this closer to a 3 or a 4, because similar to the other cherry blossoms, we can clearly tell that those are cherry blossom photos. However, we can't see the finer detail of there. So where's the guy behind him looking? Is he looking at the back of his head? Is he looking at the camera? Is he looking off to his left, off to his right? Those are things that we don't know based on the image. However, we can tell that there are two, two fire. Um, so I would say for yeah, aperture, we're gonna go with that four to five radius thing that we did for the cherry blossoms. ISO, the light looks good overall. I'm looking at the darkest parts of the image and I don't see any real noise. So ISO is probably at 200, maybe three. Definitely not 100 because the lighting doesn't look like it's the best. 
And then as far as shutter goes, it really would depend on what this photo was taken for. Are they walking into the firehouse? Are they walking out of the firehouse? Or are they just modeling for an image? That is then going to dictate shutter. But if they're not moving, I probably would say one and a hundredth of a second, just because it, it doesn't need to be that fast. Um, if it was something that they were getting ready for, a fire battle, whatever, um, then I probably would say that one and two hundred fiftieth of a second around that range. Again, something where it's a little faster on the camera, but not necessarily so fast that you're losing detail and everything else. Because the other thing to keep in mind, especially when shooting on something with like full manual, the faster we run this, then the lesser everything else becomes. And then that's the kind of combat that you're playing. So then you bump your aperture to this to let more light in. You turn your ISO in one direction to allow for more light sensitivity. It's those small details that as you keep practicing and shooting, it really starts to make more and more sense as you go. So yeah, aperture, four to five. ISO, probably that 200, 300 range. Shutter speed, I'd say if they're not moving, one and a hundredth. If they are walking, one and two fiftieth, maybe one and three hundredth of a second. This one, I always ask questions about to my class because I think this is kind of interesting. Growing up in Chicago, we have the Field Museum. We have a lot of stuffed animals at the Field Museum that look really real. So this is just a very detailed image. Now to get an image this detailed next to an animal like this, to me, seems almost impossible. If you've ever seen videos of goats, they have a big tendency of running at you with their head down and they will smack you. So my thought process is either this is a really long lens, um, or two, I think that it's a stuffed goat. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You've got beautiful detail on the horns, on the fur, where the light is. The background has a nice blur out to it, but not so blur that you can't kind of tell what the situation is. And when I look overall at the whole image, especially the darker parts on the bottom of the goat's fur, I'm not seeing noise or pixelation or anything. So background as a whole, I'm probably going to put that maybe in a similar boat of five. We're probably in that same area. This looks to be a tree trunk. The white looks to be snow and other little kind of debris and stuff on the floor. So that's where my mind would go with that. Five, I can kind of tell, but I can't tell. Uh, the next thing up are the horns. The horns have really nice detail to them and the lighting looks really good with them. So. Personally, I think that ISO is probably at eighty-four hundred at the worst. I, don't, I can't tell what the lighting source that's coming down with it. There are points like right here that are very saturated with light, and you get this kind of vignetting of a shine that comes through that doesn't feel most natural. Um, that to me could could be a fact of like a glow, if you will. So maybe the ice is a little higher than it needs to be, but not high enough that it gives noise. If not, then maybe at 200, so I'd say somewhere between 200 and 400 for the ISO. Uh, aperture five, shutter. Again, same idea as with the fireman. If this is a real go, then it's probably gonna be 100, maybe 250th, 500th of a second, kind of that range, because if this thing starts coming at you. But given how detailed these horns are, if, unless this was you know one of the newest cameras that you're looking at nowadays that has 60-something megapixels in it, um, this probably is a little bit of a longer exposure. So maybe something around like, I want to say half a second, because that's way too long. I probably would say like, one and three eighths, maybe, maybe a little bit uh, faster than that. I think a, just a longer enough time that you're going to get the detail of those grooves, of the dark spots, without getting pixelation or noise on there. It's something to keep in mind. Um, on the screen, it looks a little different. When I look at it on my iPad, I can really see the color. Or my iPad, my laptop, I can really see the color of those horns. So it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, I really think that there might have been some longer exposure, and I think that's a stuffed goat.
<laughs> which is a silly thing to talk about, but I think I've been talking about, I mean, I've been showing the same image for over a year now, and every time I teach this class, and every time I look at it, I'm like, I don't think that's a real go. Anyway, moving on. Love these images, big dog guy, but this is a great idea now to talk about speed and shutter speed, right? First and foremost, it's a beautiful sunny day. You can see the shadow where the sun is hitting, and you can see the puddles of shadow on the grass. ISO, no more than one in a hundred ISO, uh, or sorry, a hundred ISO, because you don't need a lot of uh, sensitivity towards there, because like I mentioned in the last class, natural lighting is your best friend. So in this case, you've got the best natural lighting ever. It doesn't look like there's a cloud in the sky. When we talk about background blur, before we then get into shutter speed, you can see that those are most likely cars behind there. This is some sort of dog park. However, those are blurred out so much, it's similar to the trash can I showed in the earlier slides when we talk about aperture. Those are most likely somewhere around the range of that 2.8 aperture. Because you can tell that this is greenery shrubbery, yet you don't have a lot of detail there to really expose and show you that. I think it's a 2.82 because if it was something that had a telephoto, or if it wasn't telephoto, you wouldn't be able to get a zoomed in picture. This would basically mean that you have to have a 100 prime, 50 millimeter prime, 75 millimeter prime, and you've got to kind of hope to be in the right sweet spot to get that image. Whereas if you have a telephoto, something that can zoom in and out, and if you have a higher quality one, like something with an f2.8 on there, then you're able to get the lowest possible aperture, which again, we'll talk more about when we get to lenses, but you'll be able to get the most powerful aperture that offers background blur, but gives you the ability to zoom in and out from that target. Lastly, shutter speed. Because of the motion these dogs are getting in, I mean, this dog is, looks like to be two or three feet off the ground, full extension, teeth are out, I mean it looks wild to see it trying to get that first me. And this guy looks a little bit more silly and derpy and more of a dog kind of, this is what I would expect, this is an animal, this is an animal. <laughs> um, I'm going to say at least one in a thousand speed on the shutter. Uh, again, similar to our motocross, similar to our surfing guy, when we have intense motion that's really going fast, I mean, if you've ever seen dogs running uh, at full speed, I mean they are getting good speed. So think about that when you're shooting. If you've got something that has a lot of motion, you're going to need to take a precaution with that shutter and make sure that it's at a high speed in order to get something like this. I think this is one of the last images before we talk about lenses. We've got a football player jumping into the end zone. Now a lot of people come in for sport photography and help with that because they find it tricky. But again, in my opinion, I think it's one of the more simple forms of photography because it really does come down to that shutter speed. Having that shutter speed at a higher or faster shutter is what's really going to deliver a better experience towards getting that image. So in this case, guy's running into the end zone, looks like he slipped two tackles, or at least slipped one with this guy being on the ground. He is jumping in head first, or I should say hand first, into the end zone. Shutter speed at least one in a thousand. You can see how light everything looks. You can see where his shadow is hitting and same with his opponents and his legs or maybe somebody else that's behind him. So in my case, I would probably say at least 100 ISO. No higher than that, maybe 200 ISO depending, but I think 100 would be good enough. Uh, as far as then our aperture, that's the big question. The thing that gets me with this is that you can tell that this is a football player that's on the ground. You can see the gloves, you can see the shoulder pads, the helmet. You can even probably make out the visor itself or the cage. That's definitely a number six on that gentleman on the top there. Those look to be like Nike gloves. It's those little details that if you pay attention to, you can tell that aperture necessarily isn't um, completely blurred, but it's blurred enough that you're missing some of those finer details. So in that case, we're probably looking at an aperture of 11 or 8. So something where you're getting some blur, it's not completely wide open, where the whole subject is in focus. Um, however, though, it's enough where then um, you're able to see kind of what everything that's going on on there. 
but not fine enough that you're getting perfect details on there. What about the, looks like people in the back? People in the back, absolutely. Now with those guys though, they're so far back that what we're probably getting here is that our subject, or our focus target is gonna be this guy right here. Given depth of field and where the lens is with the aperture setting on there, these are gonna definitely be closer to us. And I mean, just judging from that, they look like they're yeah. fairly close. Whereas these guys are so far back, the pylon is so far back, whatever signage is up there is far enough back that those are naturally going to get blurred out. No, it's over 100 yards away, right? 100%. <laughs> and that's another thing to keep in mind, too, is that depth of field relationship when we talk about lenses. And I actually have a really cool slide to show that off of me because we're about to get into lenses next. So that will answer that question for you. Oh, I had one more. Now, this one I took me a while to figure out, and I finally did some research and digging on it with my own experience. This is a long exposure photo. The reason I can tell is that you have these light flares that are happening. And light flares happen for two different reasons, high ISO and long exposure. Um, now you can also see that there are these red lines that cut through on the very bottom of the image. And those are also going to be a train that's coming through. This is a train stop or a train station. Um, with that being said, there is a little bit of, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, I haven't talked about it all. A uh, noise, noise. There's a slight amount of noise in this section. Not a lot, but when you look at the darkest parts of an image, that's where you tend to see the noise kind of gather in, is those dark, darkened colors. So ISO is too high. I would probably say that ISO is somewhere around the 600 to 700 range in this picture. And just given that it's a long exposure, if you're doing long exposure photography, Keep your ISO lower. The thing to keep in mind is that because your shutter is staying open for a prolonged period of time, the whole image is coming into the camera and it's coming in for a good amount of time. On top of that too, all the light is coming in for a good amount of time. So if you're taking a standard photo, that's a quick, you know, snip, snip, you know, that's where you can then play with the ISO a lot more to make sure you're getting the correct ISO based on the environment that you're in. However, if you're shooting and you're having a wide open shutter and you have a high ISO, you're going to get stuff that number one looks flared and then number two has some pixelation to it. You get the cool red lines that cut across, the bike has some nice crisp details, but there's not a lot of blur on the, on the outside of the bike, but the bike is definitely the primary focus in my opinion. So in this type of image, I probably would say that the aperture is not 22 or 32, not the most wide open, but maybe like an 18. Something that's not necessarily the highest, where it's wide open, but not something that's necessarily blurring anything out. You can't necessarily see the finer details on the building and whatnot, but you can still make out everything that's there. I use that sign in the background as a reference. I can't really read that sign. Um, however, though, I can kind of, I can deduce that it's a sign. Makes sense. So, again, learning your camera is only the start. Anyone can learn to use a camera. The biggest thing is practice. If you're going on vacation, if you're going on a work trip, if you do anything in general that takes you away from maybe your comfort zone of things you're familiar with, if you don't bring your camera with you, I think it's silly. Bring the camera with you, experiment with it. Um, I'm a weirdo, I have a tendency if I have my camera out for another event and I go shopping, I'll take it in the store with them all with me. I don't even care. I'll take pictures of products and how they're placed on shelves. I like the way, especially in grocery stores where you have lines of items and some are perfect, others are slightly skewed. I think it's just fascinating. Um, just kind of the way that that looks. We're a little different in the store here, so I don't necessarily think of anything that we have here like that. But like a place like Target or Jewel, I think it's just kind of fun. So I take my camera anywhere, everywhere and anywhere with me. If I'm doing something I don't normally do, I'll take the camera. Who knows? Maybe I'll get a cool picture. Like I said, best camera accessories that kind of are free when you think about it are practice, 
set up a, one of the things I do all the time, if I'm really trying to learn a new lens or a camera, is I'll set up a still life. I'll take a water bottle, I'll take something that's matte in color, maybe a, maybe like a paintbrush, a wooden paintbrush that has no shine to it. I'll take something that looks slick. I'll take all these different kind of looking materials that reflect light in different ways and I'll set them up on a table. Maybe I'll take a lamp out of one of my rooms and position it so the light's hitting it. Maybe I'll just turn the light on above me. But what I'm gonna do with that then is sit there and practice all of the different switches and knobs to understand how my camera's reacting to these different materials in a controlled environment. If I can start with that, that's a great way of doing things and just kind of learning more about all the products you are buying, just getting into, um, but also to just getting a better feel for my camera. Again, the more hands-on you can get, the more you're gonna learn the product. So, practice. Uh, classes, you know, there are obviously my class, and I'm happy to teach this, but I teach very basic stuff that I think can be learned in a lot of different ways. There are really amazing programs out there that'll run you through and take you through very, I'd say more cutthroat or advanced portions of it. Uh, for example, I know that at the Community College of Chicago, Oakton, they have non-credited classes where you pay three, four hundred dollars, which again is expensive, but that can really open the door for you and you get this kind of personalized experience of someone sitting there, not holding your hand, but walking you through more practice and more tips I remember when I was in school learning photography, we spent maybe two weeks, almost every single day, learning something with portrait photography and sitting people on just a bench, having different color backgrounds, lighting in all different sorts of weird ways, and just playing with aperture, shutter speed, ISO, until you kind of figured out what exactly was the right situation for that type of environment. Same thing goes for shooting outside, same thing goes for literally any type of photography. It's just practice. And that goes back to the first one. Uh, YouTube channels you love. I think YouTube is probably one of the greatest resources out there when it comes to education on cameras. I, I know I talked about it earlier, I'll talk about it again. If you bought a camera, if you type that camera in on YouTube, there are probably 150, 200 videos from very nerdy camera people who love spewing information about cameras. So they will talk your ear off, they'll tell you things that I'll never know, they'll tell you things that you will, will probably never even use, but they'll tell you, and it's kind of cool, you learn your camera inside and out. Workshops, I have a couple customers that have told me about some cool workshops they've done where they have paid to have a professional photographer teach them something really special. I had a gentleman uh, by the name of John who used to come to my classes, and he did a workshop in Arizona where this famous photographer, I can't remember their name, taught them how to take pictures of plants and cactuses specifically. And he said it was the coolest four days that he had ever done with a camera. Um, they worked with like the desert sun, reflecting light off materials. It was really cool. And the images he shared afterwards were fantastic. I did a workshop out in Germany when I went to go visit Leica where we had a model who positioned herself on a stool and we had these crazy lights going on her, but she had this crazy makeup on and it was so cool watching how the flashing lights would reflect off of certain parts and as she posed and removed sunglasses, it was so cool, it was fun, you got to really experience it and you felt like you were a, like a professional photographer for all of those kind of cool. And then travel, like I said, if you go anywhere and you don't bring your camera, I think you're silly. Bring the camera with you. Recommended accessories, I think I talked about this in the last class, I won't harp on it too much right now. If I could tell you to do anything, the top five, I think, are the most important. Have a bag, secure your product, make sure you're protecting it. Extra battery and a memory card go a long way. Again, you forget to charge your battery, you got another one in the bag, that's a bonus. You, your memory card dies on you, it doesn't work anymore, you gotta back up. I do uh, volunteer work a lot. I volunteer at an animal shelter with my photography. I volunteer for the Chicago Polar Plunge with my photography. Two of the things that, or the thing that I need the most when doing either of those is a lens cleaning kit. And it's just as simple as a little rag that I can use to clean the lens. Uh, never use your sweater, t-shirt material. It's not the appropriate thing. If you're buying a lens that costs more than the camera body, or even if you're buying a lens that is just higher end, it's not necessarily gonna show the first few times you do it, but 
time after time after time of using that type of material will cause micro scratches to come up and then that's where your focusing gets off, uh, your image just doesn't look right, there's blurriness to some parts of it, microfiber cloths. All the four eyes friends out there, those little cloths they give you with your sunglasses, glasses, that's the thing you should be using on your lens. Um, a strap, well, most camera companies give you a strap when you buy a camera, but they make really nice padded straps or quick release straps, I definitely recommend it. Um, those, I'm sorry, the top four. Those are the things I think people need the most. Tripods are extra. If you have shaky hands, definitely invest in one. Uh, external hard drives, if you're not a fan of cloud-based solution for storing your photos, great thing to have with you. 100 terabyte, one terabyte, five terabytes. That'll hold probably five million photos, something ridiculous like that, but you'll never lose your images. Polarizing filter, great if you've had polarizing sunglasses, you can contest to the health and safety that does for your eyes. Same thing goes with your photos. You're taking pictures of water or cars or I get people who do like photos in snow. When you get that intense shine that comes off untouched snow, it hurts. It's terrible. Polarizing filter cuts through that. ND filter does a little bit of everything. It's kind of cool. They do what's called variable stops on there. As you turn the ND filter in one way or the other, you get a, it's called neutral density. You get a more dense or a less dense filter um, and what happens with that is that it'll help cut through the harsh layers but then if you don't need that it tones down and almost just becomes a little bit more of an advanced UV filter. So if you're in between filters, I like the ND filter the most, that's my personal recommendation. Um, I think it works a little better than a polarizing filter and has a little more kind of oomph to it because you can do more with it. It is a more expensive filter because of how it rotates. And then additional lenses, which is what we're going to talk about now. I think lenses are a very important part of, if not the most important part of the camera. In the camera world, there is a saying, and I like that saying a lot. I think it's kind of funny. Date your body, marry your glass. Your body is going to become outdated, uh, no pun intended. Your body is going to slowly but surely start to have defects. It's going to slow down. It's not going to perform. When I talk about you know, the mode dial being your gear shift in your car, there is a part of your camera called the shutter count. And what that is, is as many times as the camera has taken pictures. After a certain shutter count, it's like mileage on a car, it just starts to have problems. It slows down, it doesn't recognize targets as fast enough, doesn't focus fast enough, it might let too much light in, you get this thing called light leak sometimes. It's more with film, but it can happen with digital cameras. All in all, your body will slowly but surely betray you. You get about 10 good years out of a camera if you're using it regularly. If you're not, or you invest in a very, very high-end camera that can take the beating like that, then you're probably fine. But where you should be putting the majority of your money in and where you should invest your time is your glass. The glass is going to be the most important part of the camera. So let's start with focal length and zoom. Focal length and zoom, and I put zoom in quotation marks, I think they're the same thing, and for the most part they are. Depending on the lens that you're shooting on, zoom, or focal length, is going to equate to the same thing. Now, scientists and very, very smart people figured this out years and years ago of taking a series of pieces of glass and putting them in front of each other, spacing them in such a way that when you twist or You think I hate this weather change right now. I just either want it to be warm or cold or neither. I don't care. Make mm -hmm. your mind. Anyway, the way that they do this is they'll put different series of glass stacked on top of each other. That glass is then going to change the magnification distance. Using their brains, they figured out a way that they could equate a millimeter size of the lens towards what our actual zoom is. We are not zooming 400 millimeters on a ruler. This is a completely different measurement. This is what they got onto. If I knew more about it, I'd explain that. But I do not have that degree. What I do know, though, is that the smaller the number, the more wide of an angle you're going to get. And the bigger the number, the more tight the focus is going to be. 
At 70 millimeter, we see everything that's available to us. The bright blue sky, mountain range in the background, the birds that are sitting in the marshy area that we're trying to get pictures of, a city, and then greenery. As we start to change the number and zoom in, our main target is going to be those birds. That's the main thing we're trying to get. Gulls. I don't remember it's that one. Either way, there are the birds. As we're looking at it, though, we can see that not only the birds are coming closer to us, but our background is also getting closer and closer. So while we're taking pictures, we're going to get what's called compression. Compression is going to take things that are in the foreground and background and start to almost merge those together. We can see how far away the birds are from the land and how close we are to the birds. Yet as we zoom in, it almost feels like that background is now getting more and more up on the birds, and it feels like we're losing the distance that was once there and is over there. That's the compression portion of a photograph. Some people notice it, some people don't, and I have another example that really shows off compression. However, we can see though, as the numbers go up and up, we get more of a zoom in. And that's the main thing to keep in mind. Depending on the photography that you're trying to do, some people don't need zoom lenses. And I have another slide that I'll explain that in just a second here. Focal length and compression are a great way to show this one. In this case, the photographer has used this model and set them up in such a way where the person isn't moving, the photographer is just keeping that boy or guy in perfect alignment and then backing himself up or bringing himself closer based on what lens he has. We can see that at something like a 16 millimeter, which is the lowest number it gets to, the face becomes extremely narrow, the no nose comes out, and we get almost a distorted or compressed image of the person's face. As we then get into a larger number, like 200, that tree comes right up forward, and on top of that too, the face now becomes a little bit more plump, big, whatever you want to call it. The human eye works as a 50 millimeter lens. That's the starting point. There's a nickname for it, and I'll talk about it later too, but it's the nifty 50. People love the 50 millimeter lens. That's also one of my personal favorite lenses. With that being said, depending on the photography we're trying to take, if we're constantly using wide angle or zoom to get portrait, we might not get the achievement we're trying to. We might get a compressed or a distorted image. Both of those you know, can be flip-flopped. But this gives you a nice, clean way of seeing that distortion. In the similar boat, too, like I was mentioning as well, that's the, it's the 50 millimeter when it stops there. I wish I could pause it. It's, it's a, a GIF or a GIF, whatever you call it. <laughs> uh, wherever, at 50, that's the true distance the tree is from the boy. So you can see that when they're zooming, that tree comes back and forth. Yeah. He didn't move. That's the background then coming up. In a similar way with the birds, which is a little harder to see, but it, it, at least for me, doing this for so long, I can see it. It's, I can really see it here. It's very apparent. So with that being said, common lenses, what you're going to see, and then what you need. And I'm going to keep the quotations around need because I don't know if anyone needs anything. Start with your kit lens. When you bought a camera, and maybe you're experienced, you avoided this, but for a lot of beginning photographers, they're going to start with a kit lens. A kit lens typically is always going to be a somewhat form of a telephoto lens. Telephoto lenses get their name because they, they telescope. They move back and forth similar to the larger telescopes that you see out there when looking at stars or constellations or what have you. So in this case, we can tell that it's a telescoping lens, not only because of this middle ring right here, which would be the zoom ring, but because it says 1855 on there, meaning it starts at an 18, which is a nice wide angle, moves into a 55, which is more of your portrait prime. However, another distinguishing factor of a kit lens is typically what we would call a variable aperture. So when we look at a lens, it'll have a maximum aperture number on there. Now, 
People, when I say maximum aperture, think I'm talking about the high end, 32, 22. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the lowest number that this lens can hit possible, because that's going to be our background and foreground blur. That's what we're looking for, or we want a good blur when we're doing portrait photography. So for example, this lens in particular has a maximum aperture of 3.5 to 5.6. What that means is that when I start at 18, no zoom, wide angle, I'm going to get an aperture blur of 3.5. As I then zoom in to 55, it's going to increase up to 5.6. And when I get to 55, I can't go back down to 3.5 anymore. I'm going to only be at 5.6 as my maximum aperture. Can I go up to 22? Absolutely. Can I go to 18, 11, anywhere in the middle? Of course. But I'm not going to get any better than 5.6 at the 55. So a kit lens typically isn't the most high quality glass. It's usually not the best aperture, but it's typically something that gives the user of their new camera the ability to start taking photos immediately. And it's a great economic kind of buy-in to a camera without having to invest uh, in a lot. Uh, when I bought my camera, my Sony, I bought a 7R Mark V. It is a $4,000 camera. The lens itself was $2,200. It was nearly half of what I paid for the camera body, and the fact that I only get 10 years out of it kind of scares me because then I mean, I gotta buy another body and it's gonna be expensive. But the investment's in the glass because the higher quality the glass is, number one, the better image I'm going to get, but number two, um, the longer it lasts as long as it's taken care of properly. Not to say that the kit lens won't last a while, but typically the kit lenses are made out of plastic or other cheaper materials. They're not necessarily meant to last forever. Um, but at the same time, if you're really good about your products and you don't damage things, there's no reason why this shouldn't last you into your next camera in upgrade in the future. The Nifty 50 or the Prime. So we call it the Nifty 50 because it's a 50 millimeter lens and it's very nifty. However, a prime lens also fits in this category, and a prime lens is going to be a single numbered lens. Now, I get people who ask why they would want a prime lens. Why wouldn't I just get a telephoto lens so I can have something that does everything? If you are a portrait photographer, or you want to take the most beautiful pictures of wildlife, or up close pictures of flowers, or you know, perennials, or whatever have you, whatever your fancy is, uh, insects or one more season. Bless you. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Um, I had a gentleman who came in, he was a dentist, and he wanted to take pictures of his client's teeth when he was performing root canals. And he showed me some of these pictures of just teeth mingled up, all this stuff. It was the, like, oh, it made my skin crawl a little bit. I was like, that's wild. And another guy who, obsessed with spiders, would take these hyper-detailed pictures of spiders where you could see little hairs on them. And like, I mean, you could tell these things were the size of a penny. He was getting that close. That's the kind of thing you get with a prime or macro lens too, but you get that kind of picture with something like this because, number one, the lens is built to have a maximum aperture, usually something like a 1.4 or 1.2, maybe even a 2 as well but something that gives you really good background to foreground blur. The next thing then is going to be the lens itself. Typically on a prime lens, the coating that goes into it, so when I say coating, I don't mean like computer coating. When they put these lenses together, they coat them in different types of material. Typically in the middle of the lens, there's nitrogen gas. That nitrogen gas helps keep those lenses suspended in the place that they're supposed to be also helps for the fluidity of the rings to turn back and forth. It's those types of processes and steps that they do with the lens that help keep the crispness and the detail of the photo. So when someone asks me as a, as a salesperson, as a camera person, what's the difference if I buy the $300 lens versus the $2,000 lens? It all comes down to the quality of image you're gonna get. And that might not be noticeable on the entry level camera, but when you have a higher end camera, or even just one of the new modern mirrorless cameras that they make nowadays, it sometimes can make or break the difference of 
a very professional quality looking video and, and your candid photo that you're taking on vacation. So nifty 50 prime lenses, it, it depends. Um, I do really like the 50 millimeter. My personal favorite lens is a prime, it's 35. I think 35 is the most versatile lens out there, and I'll go to bat for it any day. It's great for wide angle photography, street photography, and the number is close enough to 50 that you don't get nearly as much distortion on it as you would if you were to shoot with a 12 or an 18 or a, you know, a very wide angle lens. So I think that's really nice too. Zoom or telephoto lenses are next, and it's very similar to the kit lens. However, a telephoto or zoom lens is not unique in you know any way, shape, or form from telephoto or uh, from a uh, kit lens uh, companion or component. But when you're looking into telephoto lenses, typically you can find higher end glass. Now, when I say higher end glass, I mean it in the sense that that coating mechanism, the interior of the lens, they're built differently. So when we look at either of these lenses, as a camera person, for Canon, it's got the red stripe going across, we call that L-series glass. I forgot what L stands for, but that is their highest quality glass you can buy. What that basically has is a completely different lens coating system. It usually has some of the best glass going from edge to edge, which reduces the amount of distortion you get, and it increases the sweet spot on the lens's glass. Well, all the sweet spot does is give you more detail, more focus, better crispness. Same thing when we look at Sony. If you've got a Sony camera, the orange G is going to be a similar boat. That G is a G Master lens. That's considered one of their top of the line. This is a 24 to 70. This is a great walking around, everyday type of lens because you can get wide angle all the way to portrait. And the 2.8 aperture that you get there gives you a really good background blur. Is it going to be as good as a 50 prime of a 1.2 or 1.4 blur? No. But is it going to still deliver you a very, very professional photo? Absolutely. Same thing with something like a 70 to 200. If you are a nature lover and you love taking pictures of birds, but birds are all the way up in the trees or you know, they're doing all these different patterns and you go close to them, they might run away. People that opt in for their big telephoto zoom lenses, a 70 to 200, be a nice example of a way of picking up from where it's at. So if you are going into it, you have your camera body that you picked out, but you want to buy your own lenses, a good idea might be do a 24 to 70 and then get a 70 to 200. You've covered both your bases. The ones that I talk to people about, I'll show them the next slide, so only the, for the Canon, only the top of the line will have the red line? Yep, so for Canon, if you see that red line on their lens, that means it's their highest quality glass that they're offering. For Sony, if you see that gold, G, that, that orange G, that's their G Master lens. They also make um, a black one as well too. I think it's also just called G Master. They just use the colors to look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But the black one usually is the next quality down from the orange one. The orange is their top, then the black one is their kind of intermediate one, and then their entry level is either going to just say Zeiss or won't say anything. No. For Canon, uh, red line. For Nikon, usually it's Nikkor glass. They'll have a gold line going somewhere on the lens, but typically it'll say Nikkor on there. That's how you know. Now, prime versus zoom lenses. The big thing I have to say with these, zoom lenses is more flexible. If you don't want to move yourself around and do stuff with you know, the lens to get the image, you can zoom in and out, change the aperture, and you'll get the image that you're looking for. When it comes to a prime lens, if you want to get an image and you need to get a different angle, you're going to have to move and take that picture from a different angle or get closer or go backwards. There's no zoom on there. When you get a prime lens, though, you get the best aperture possible, which gives you a beautiful background to foreground separation and will improve things like portrait or subject-based photography or more of you know, a walking around street photography, if you will, because you have the ability to keep shoot wide open or shoot with a um, higher aperture, if you will. 
with a zoom lens, you're limited to two point eight, which for some people is fine, but for especially portrait photographers or somebody who's taking pictures with meticulous detail on there, the 1.4, 1.2 aperture is a huge game changer for those images. Not to say the 2.8 won't give you a great picture, but if you compare the two together of the same thing that you're shooting, you're gonna see the difference between these two. Uh, the only issue with zoom is that because of the way the glass is shaped on there, they can't go any lower than 2.8. You will never see a zoom lens lower than 2.8. If you do see it, I guarantee it's gonna be multi, multi, multi thousands of dollars. The last lens I have before I tell you the lenses that you need, the travel lens. The travel lens is a great all-in-one lens. Um, my best example for this, I have, especially now that summer's around the corner, a lot of people coming in for safaris. They want to go on a safari. They're like, I'm going to be in the back of this, you know, roll cage Jeep. Uh, we're going to see lions in the distance. I can only bring X amount of weight with me. What do you recommend? Well, if the customer already has a camera, they've already invested in a body, a travel lens is perfect because it's an all-in-one experience. You're going to get a wide angle into something that's more of a tight focus, like the 135. On top of that, too, um, this is usually going to give you something that just is very flexible as far as what you can get and can't get. The only downside to this lens is the same thing with the kit lens. The aperture is going to be more of a uh, variable aperture. So in this case, you got an 18 to 135. When you start at 18, it's a 3.5 aperture. When you get to 135, it's 5.6. And you can't go lower than 5.6 on this lens. So it's a good lens. It's great, again, if you're traveling and you need something flexible, because um, it does everything. However, it's on the flip downside, uh, you don't necessarily get that crisp background blur or that foreground do a background separation. Not letting as much light in, it has a smaller sweet spot. There's a couple downsides to it, but again, depending on what you're limited to, especially on trips or traveling, this is a great way to bring everything in one. What lenses do you need? And again, I keep the quotations around there because for me personally, I think if I have a 35 millimeter for the, oh, that was my only lens for the rest of my life, I'd be totally fine and make it work. However, everybody's a little different. So I say need around these because I feel like these are gonna be the three main lenses that if you are a photographer, that you're gonna to wanna to look at. So for example, I call, or we call it in the photography world, the Trinity. A prime lens of some sort is a necessity. A 50 millimeter prime is still considered one of the best lenses out there. It's a 50 millimeter. It's the same viewing angle that the human eye sees it. 24 to 70 is then going to be the next one. This is your uh, short telephoto zoom. It's going to offer you a wide angle to a tighter angle. It's at some of the similar points that the 50 does, but if you're not taking something where you need that meticulous detail, the 24 to 70 is a great walking around lens. I consider it a vacation lens, um, because if you go into something like you know, a famous church or a famous building, you want to get the, the wholeness of it. 24 is wonderful. Um, but let's say that the family and you are out to dinner, everyone's standing at the table, you want to get a good picture of them, you can zoom into the 24, or from the 24 to the 50 or the 70 and get a really nice portrait shot of them, all without sacrificing quality, and crispness, and sharpness. And now let's say that you are a nature lover. You like to go out and see the birds, see things in the distance, and get those really amazing, hard to get shots. 70 to 200 is your next step, but I also put the plus because sometimes that's not enough for people. They make lenses that are 100 to 500 millimeters. Um, they make uh, 200 to 400. They make all sorts of different lenses. I personally think the 70 to 200 is enough. If any time you think it's not enough, you can always buy the extender for the lens, which will give you two times or 1.4 times that focal length on there. Those are the kinds of things that I think overall if you are trying to get a complete lens collection that gives you all of the pieces you're looking for, this is a great way to get into the whole thing um, or what you should be looking at. Again, I put the quotations around need because not everybody's going to need a wildlife lens. So a lot of people don't really invest in the 70 to 200 unless they have a need or an urge for it. 
What I would recommend to any photographer who's just getting started or people who are questioning lenses, start with your kit lens. I do think that's a great way to get into the whole thing. It really gives you the ability to try something out at a low cost, to start taking pictures immediately. The one thing with photography is it is an expensive hobby. These lenses are not cheap. I know that this one from Canon probably retails for about $1,800. This one from Nikon I know is about $2,400. And something like this, which is an ultrasonic lens, they no longer make this one from Canon, but that would have been at least a $1,000 lens. Ooh. All that stuff adds up after a while. Start with the kit lens, become familiar with it, make sure that number one, you like photography to start with. But number two, once you start shooting with that and you get a chance to then experiment with some of these lenses, they offer rental companies. I mean, even if you go into your camera shop, like ourselves, we'll let you try the camera lens on your body to see how that feels and looks to you. But you'll see the difference right away. And then that's what you can strive for on there. But I really think the kit lens for a beginning photographer or for anybody who is interested in it will really give you, the user, the ability to figure out what you need and don't need. Two questions. Yes. So the, they, the uh, 50 millimeter one, they only make it in prime or is it uh, available well, on... Uh, anything that is a single number lens, it's like 50 just by itself, that's what you'd call prime lens. Oh, okay. So even if 50 said 35, if that, if that was a 35 or a 90 or a 75 or a 105, those are all prime lenses. Oh, okay. It's one so number. prime doesn't move, it just... Yep. Yeah. Prime stays the same. And Telephoto moves. Okay. The second question, that's the ring you were talking about? Yep. Like for this one? That's for Nikon. The golden for the Nikon? Yeah. So Nikon, they'll do Nikkor on there. They'll also do this little N symbol. And then some of the lenses, and I think they got away from it right now with the Z-mount series, but the newer cameras really don't have that gold. The old ones did. Oh. Okay. But it's that little shape right there. That Nikkor glass. That's all we got for you guys. So next week is advanced cameras. I kept you guys till seven, so I do apologize for going a little past. This is a longer class in general. This is uh, the intermediate one. Advanced though is next week. We're going to be talking about things like photo editing, uh, framing, and then a little bit more about content creation as a whole. We're going to go through things like accessories and kind of break those down a little bit more and explain what they exactly do. Um, hopefully. I see you guys there. But other than that, do we have any questions for me? Yeah, I mean, specific to, to this. Yeah, Scott. Just I'm saying to the, these, the, these, these, what they're calling it, like program, would that be the same as automatic? Yeah, so that's the program uh, automatic. So in this camera, you have automatic. That's what that green and is. That's, that's where it's at right now. Exactly. If you slide over to. Automatic. Things like your focus parameters, things like your uh, light balance, things that you can customize in the camera are now available to you. The only thing that stays the same are the aperture and shutter value. The camera's going to do that work for you. All you're doing is changing, you know, I want my camera to recognize cats or dogs instead of humans. That's something that this can do. That's what program on that is. Flexible priority. But the priority is going to then be your ability to change kind of whatever you want. The C1, C2, which are customizable ones, whatever you leave right. those on, they're going to stay that way. Flexible is in the same boat, where let's say there is something that you want to fix or play with more than something else, you can do that on there. Similar to that, but this one allows for things like your aperture or your shutter, so you can do that as well too. Okay. Um, automatic video, that's what that guy stands for. See, See what I did. there's all sorts of different. Right? Yeah. Um, this one I think is double exposure. I haven't used that one myself that often. Creative filter. So double oh, exposure. Okay. Yeah. What I just created. Yeah. Thank you. Um, B is for bulb. Right. That's for long right. exposures. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, anytime. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. So then what is next week in India? Advanced. So we talk about photo editing, we talk about framing images, we talk about uh, more video content creation and just content creation in general. And we really break down a lot of the uh, more advanced accessories like tripods, gimbals, uh, microphones, lighting, that sort of thing. So it's the next step in like, okay, 
I've mastered my camera. I know how to use all the buttons and the settings on there. Now, how, what's the next step to making my photography even better? It really comes down to edit your photos and then have the right accessories for it. Everything's always there. Well, you don't want, you still want to get rid of the noise, huh? See, a lot of people, the thing is, is I mean, the crispness you can, and the things you can do with the photos, I mean, I, I've taken some of my photos, I, I've been trying to play with astrophotography for years, but it's hard in Chicago just with all the lighting and whatnot, but when I, if I ever go to like Wisconsin, Indiana, I bring a tripod with me to try to shoot it, and if you go and edit after you tried to do last week, to, oh, I had to work with everything. We actually, it was really cool, some people had some uh, the glasses, and we were able to stand in the atrium, it was all right above the window window, there was a Looks like you're with audio recording, you're trying to add distortion. Exactly. Especially with digital, you're adding distortion. Yeah. Which isn't what people think it is, but yeah, yeah. it's not like a guitar. Exactly. No, and it's funny because, especially like with the Grateful Dead and everything with them, too, you see here the guys like with, with uh, Dick and then uh, I can't think of his name. Dave? Dave, the one who's also doing the other ones. Like the way that they're going in and editing and changing, I mean, they're, that's the whole point, is because that distortion, that live sound, so amazing. Well, their, 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 their live sound was pretty clean. Exactly. It's for, especially for what it was at the time. Thanks for the. Anytime. Anytime. Thanks for being here. All right. Well, it looks like everybody on the line, I don't really have any questions from there. So I will leave you guys here. Thanks for coming to my camera class this week. Like I said, next week is advanced. We'll start at the same times, 5.30 to 7, uh, usually 5.30 to 6.30. Then we make the last 30 minutes questions. If any of you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, my phone number email is listed on there. Give me a call anytime. Shoot me an email. Um, I'm off Tuesday, Wednesdays, and I can always help if need be. As always, everybody, thanks for joining. Sorry again for the congestion. We're going to get past that, hopefully. Uh, have a great day. Be safe. And I will see everybody next week for another awesome camera.